listen up, take a seat. It's Young Money Socrates here, about to drop a hot beat. Philosophy and righteousness, virtue and temperance is what I fight for and with hard success. So let me ask you a little pull-ups. What's worse? Please converse. There's no need for the outburst. Is it more evil to commit or endure wrong? Does one make you more unhappy and suffer long? Despite the fact that none of his works survived, Protagoras of Abdera, who lived from 490 to 420 BC, is one of the most important and controversial thinkers in the history of philosophy. And I hope tonight we'll see why he's important and why he's controversial. So, unfortunately, again, since his works don't survive, scholars are saddled with the task of unpacking his ideas from a relatively short list of surviving quotations. And as you can see in passage one and two, we see two of his most famous quotations known as fragments here. Quotation number one, we're told that his book on the gods began concerning the gods. I can't say whether they exist or they don't exist. It's a difficult question and life is short. Passage number two, his most famous surviving quotation, the human being is the measure of all things. The things that are, that they are, the things that are not, that they are not. Now, these are very densely packed passages. So just the task of trying to figure out exactly what he's referring to from such short passages. Fortunately, we also have a much longer passage known as the Great Speech, which runs for eight pages in the original Greek text and appears in one of Plato's works called the Protagoras, known name for Protagoras. Now, scholars often disagree about subtle points but in the case of interpreting Protagoras' ideas, the differences could not be more profound. Let's look at this uh, in two passages. For thousands of years, Protagoras was dismissed as a fraud, as an intellectual fraud. And this is indicated in passage number three from the second century historian Gellius. Gellius writes, this Protagoras was no philosopher at all, right? For charging a great fee, he would teach his students to manipulate truth rather than to seek truth, to make the weaker speech defeat the stronger. Sometimes people refer to the ancient sophists like the modern law school and, and learning to manipulate truth, learning to manipulate arguments rather than to pursue the truth. In contrast, in more recent scholarship, there's been a whole reassessment of Protagoras, and this is represented in passage number four from George Grote, a 19th century British historian. And look at what Grote says. Grote says, from the dialogue, and we're gonna talk about this dialogue tonight. This is where the great speech comes from. It's clear that Plato doesn't see Protagoras as corrupt, unworthy, or incompetent. And by implication, Grote seems to suggest if Plato didn't think of him as corrupt, we shouldn't think of him as corrupt. Now, wait a minute. If you compare those two passages, Gellius says this guy is completely corrupt. Grote says he's not corrupt. And this paradox, this dilemma, this contradiction between these two radically divergent interpretations of Protagoras is what motivates my scholarship, my research on his ideas. How could it be that when scholars are drawing on the same text, they have such divergent views? My answer to, is, is perhaps suggested in the title of tonight's talk, Protagoras' Secret Teaching. Protagoras had two sets of teaching, as we'll see in a minute. A public teaching that promoted morality, which is where Grote gets his idea from, but also a secret teaching. And we're going to see, by an examination of his great speech in tonight's lecture, how he uses esoteric rhetoric to let those in the know in on uh, the secret teaching, even in the public discourse. Socrates warns us in passage number five there that we should be careful because in his own day, Socrates says all of Greece was deceived by Protagoras for more than 40 years. The whole time uh, Protagoras was teaching, his whole career, Socrates says he swindled all of Greece. He charged great fees, took students under his tutelage and left them, Socrates says, worse than when he took them. Right? All the time claiming to teach them about ethics and morality and make them better people. And then in the most interesting passage, passage number six, 
that sparks my research. Socrates reveals something very interesting. How did he perpetuate this deception? Socrates says, by the graces, passage number six, this Protagoras, a very wise man, uttered this dark statement, this dark saying to the common herd, like ourselves, the public teaching, right? but then told the truth in secret to his students. So again, Socrates is indicating Protagoras had two different, completely different messages, two different teachings, one promoting morality, one promoting a corrupt morality, right? or an immorality, one might say. And in spite of this very provocative argument, very few scholars have attempted to apply this idea that Protagoras had a secret or two sets of teaching to an interpretation of his ideas. To me, this is the answer of why there's such divergent readings. Let's turn to passage 11. Protagoras himself indicates what he's up to. He says that this art of sophistry practices a certain kind of teaching that incurs odium if one were to know its true ideas and thus those who practice sophistry disguise it behind a decent dress. And thus in the passage number seven we see Socrates returning to this image of dressing up the truth or hiding the truth or disguising the truth. Later on after the great speech Socrates then questions Protagoras and he says just like the doctor asks the patient to disrobe so that he can examine him. He says, Protagoras, expose some more of your ideas. Take off the dressing, the disguise, the nice outer covering so that we can see what you're really up to. Okay, so now let's turn to a discussion of the great speech itself and we'll see if we can first understand the public teaching and then we're gonna deconstruct it a little and see if we get to his secret teaching. So the speech itself is prompted, again, in a debate with Socrates over the question whether or not one can teach ethics. Socrates wonders, and, and this makes Socrates look like the moral reprobate. Socrates says, I don't think ethics and morality can be taught. And he points to famous Athenian citizens like Pericles, great generals and statesmen, right? And we can think of, you know, good parents, Maybe there's some good parents in the audience tonight. And yet you try with all your might to raise good kids, and it doesn't always work. And thus, Socrates argues, maybe ethics is not like learning other things where you go to school, you go to ethics school, you, you learn the, the knowledge, you take the test, you get the license, and you're a licensed electrician. It doesn't work like that in the moral realm. So says Socrates. Protagoras refutes Socrates, he strongly, vehemently disagrees and offers the great speech in response. And he begins the great speech with a story, and who doesn't like a good story? So here's how the story goes. Once upon a time, a long time ago, Protagoras envisions a time before there were living creatures, when all that existed were the gods. He appeals to the ancient gods of mythology. Protagoras, again, writing and speaking and teaching in the fifth century BC is appealing to the old gods that Homer and Hesiod and all the other poets had discussed. And he says that when the living creatures, all the different living creatures were in the womb of the earth, the gods formed them, shaped their bodies, but then entrusted the Titan deities, particularly Epimetheus and Prometheus, to distribute various attributes that would allow each species to survive. According to the myth, long ago when the earth was new, the great Zeus, king of the gods, ruled the heavens from high atop Mount Olympus. And as he watched over this planet, he was filled with concern. All was not right in his eyes. He called upon two lesser gods, Epimetheus and his brother, Prometheus, to resolve the problem. You called on us, Zeus? Yes. It's about Earth. I've been following its progress. Day after day, it's the same old thing. The sun comes up, it goes down. Tide comes in, it goes out. It's a young planet. It's still primitive. It's dull! Now go down there and create something befitting of a god's imagination.
the Mutants filled the Earth with his wonderful creations, Prometheus was still contemplating what his contribution would be. Hey, Prometheus. What kind of creature did you make? I didn't make them. I found them. Look, they're hunting. Those hairless, two-legged things? They don't stand a chance against my bison. We'll see. And so Epimetheus, the Titan deity, distributes various traits to the living species. Each one, he gives a different trait that would allow it to survive. Some he gave, you know, strong claws. Some he gave a thick coat of fur. Some he allowed to be fast, like the jaguar. Some could fly away, right? The little tiny bird can just fly away and isn't frightened of the lion. And yet, saving the best for last, right? He, he waited and to distribute everything, saving the best for last. He finally got to human beings and he ran out of resources. He spent all his resources and ended up with a big uh, debt on his credit card, ended up with nothing left in his bag of tricks to give to mankind. And so his brother Prometheus comes to inspect how well his brother did, and he realizes he ran out of things. And he says, Prometheus says, man is naked, all right? Unbedded, unshod, <laughs> shelterless, right? We'd freeze to death without some sort of trait to preserve our survival. And so Prometheus comes up with an idea. Here's his great idea. He says, maybe humans could use something that the gods possess. The perfect gift. Something that could help them flourish and become a great civilization. The gift of fire. Absolutely not. I don't care how cold they are. Fire belongs to the gods. But Zeus, with fire they could do great things, sire. Build cities in your image. Fight battles in, in your name. These inferior creatures? They will misuse the power. They are just animals, like the creations of Epimetheus. No, they're more than that. They're something very different. Something almost godlike. God, to think they have what it takes to endure the hardships and suffering, the joys and the pain of being a god. Just give them a chance. If we don't do that, we'll never know what they can do. Give them fire. They will think they are gods. They will think they are above us. That's a dangerous thing, my friend. Especially coming from a god like yourself. I won't let them suffer like this. Volcano lived Hephaestus, god of the forge. A reclusive god who made weapons of war. For Zeus, Apollo, and all of the other gods of Mount Olympus. Trespassers. <laughs> I welcome them with my hammer. So 
what did Prometheus do? He goes to the craftsman god, Hephaestus, and steals the knowledge of the arts along with fire. He steals from Athena, the goddess of wisdom, and the craftsman god, Hephaestus, knowledge of the productive arts and fire that you can use to fashion things. And so now human beings were provided with the ability to build shelter, to build you know, fashion weapons, to fight off the animals. Now they're no longer fearing the lion and the tiger and the bear and so on and so forth. They can build a little fence around them and make a nice zoo. But Prometheus, as good of a thief as he was, couldn't get into the citadel of Zeus. Zeus was protecting of all things justice, and this would be an important trait. Because while humankind could now build shelter and, again, build weapons, now they were fighting with each other in the cities. We call it fire. <gasps> There's nothing to fear. I will show you how to tame the fire magic and make it serve you. With this great gift of fire, Prometheus had given man hope for the future. But would it last? Another load ready to go. Very nice. It's just the way I envisioned it. Have you heard? There is another village in the next valley. That's wonderful news. Maybe we can travel there and trade our wares. I've come up with a little something of my own. Over many years, using the gift of fire, the humans evolved from a primitive tribe into a flourishing civilization. They've come a long way, don't you think, Epimetheus? Not bad for two-legged hairless creatures. They're not like your animals, Epimetheus. Look at the way they hold their heads up proudly to the heavens. Almost like gods themselves. And so they fought off the forces of nature, but without a knowledge of politics and ethics, mankind was at a loss. And it's at this point in the story that Zeus who was at first protecting justice, now decides to intervene into human history and to bring justice to mankind. And Hermes, the messenger god, asks him, how should I distribute this knowledge of politics, knowledge of how to get along, knowledge of laws and ethics? Should I distribute it like other kinds of knowledge? In other words, not everyone in Houston needs to be an electrician. We can rely on some percentage of the population being electricians and plumbers and doctors. But Zeus, in one of the most important lines in all of Western history, declares, no, let all have a share. This is passage number 14. Let all have a share. Cities could not survive if this knowledge of justice was only given to a few. And make there too a law of my ordaining that who cannot respect and right shall die the death as a public pest, as a menace. Look at what Protagoras has done. He's drawn on the old god Zeus that, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Iliad and the Odyssey, the old gods had legitimated monarchy and hierarchy and a nobility and an aristocracy. And here we see Zeus legitimating democracy. And in fact, this is one of the things that Protagoras is credited with, why he's so important. He's the first thinker that we know of in the history of the world to provide a rationale and defense for democracy. And in part, here he gives us his mythic defense of it. That Zeus intervenes into history. Protagoras then follows this myth with the logical part. And he then appeals, you don't think ethics can be taught, Socrates, but if we look at every single cultural and political and social institution, we see it's all about instilling ethics into people. So he says, you look at what the parents do with the child, what the tutors do, then the schoolmasters, the, and finally into the legal system. Every part of Greek life is about educating people. He says, 
with each thing. The, they say, this is just, that's not just, this is holy, that's not holy, right? This is noble, this is base. If somebody obeys, that's fine, right? Good boy, good girl. But if they don't obey, they treat him as a bent and twisted piece of wood that they straighten with threats and blows. And maybe sounds harsh for our time, maybe time out in today's day. And finally, he concludes his speech. So Protagoras, again, has attempted to prove that ethics can be taught and appeals to that it is God-given by Zeus, instilled by Zeus in the mythic part, and then appealing to actual practice, what goes on in Greece, that if we look at every social and cultural institution, it instills virtue. Okay, so now let's begin to deconstruct what we just read. That's the public teaching. Ethics can be taught. That sounds very, as Grote says, very moralistic, very good, very ethical, right? But if we think about it and compare passage 14 and passage 15, we see there's a blatant contradiction there. Passage 14 suggested virtue is innate, God-given. But in passage 15, he's very clear. Ethics are only instilled in people by, unfortunately, by, in his case, by beating it into them. Right? And that people innately are not so ethical. In fact, what was the saving grace that Prometheus did to save humanity? He stole, right? So our innate tendency that we need for our survival is stealing. That brings us to examination of his appeal to the gods, right? Because Protagoras appeals to the gods, which makes him seem, again, in his public discourse, like a good orthodox pagan. If we look at growth, again, passage number 12, he says, from this, it looks like <laughs> Protagoras is a very religious guy. But let's go back to passage number one. What does Protagoras tell us about his religious beliefs outside of the myth? Concerning the gods, I can't say, even if they exist or not. It's a difficult question, and life is short. In other words, maybe I shouldn't waste my time with something that can't be proved. Moreover, let's examine how his gods serve as models, right? If we're to be like God, if that's the idea in every religious view, let's see how well his gods do in displaying the various ethics. Again, the whole point of his speech here is to teach people about ethics and morality. Protagoras identifies three core virtues he speaks of. Justice, moderation, and holiness. Justice, giving to each what's owed, moderation, not eating too much, not drinking too much, right? and holiness, respecting the divine. But again, the story began with Epimetheus being immoderate, squandering his resources, not setting a budget, not saving something for mankind. And in terms of justice and holiness, right? what did Prometheus do? He stole. That's not law-abiding. That's not just. And who, moreover, whom did he steal from? From the other gods. That doesn't sound very holy. So his gods violate his very rules. That said, we should note, in spite of Prometheus's transgressions, he does exhibit two virtues that Protagoras conveniently forgot about. Right? Protag Prometheus, whose name literally means prometheus in Greek, to think ahead, to see ahead, he saw what human beings would need, displays great wisdom. And moreover, his brazenness, his bravery in breaking into Athena and Hephaestus' uh, dwellings to steal these goods shows his courage. Oh, Socrates questions Protagoras, how, aren't these virtues too, bravery and courage? You forgot about this? Now Protagoras says, oh yeah, yeah, those are virtues too, and in fact, wisdom is the most important one. Well, one scholar, which brings us to passage 16, takes note of this forgetfulness on Protagoras' part. It's not a small point that he forgot. Hemingway here notes how this shows two different sets of virtue. Demotic virtue, demotic meaning virtue for the many, he says, is this kind of restraint and law-abidingness. Again, what we see in moderation and justice, that the many people, you guys should be, behave yourself. But then 
What we see in Prometheus' actions, Hemingway identifies as elite virtue, a kind of virtue for a few. Wink, wink. Right? Be brave, be daring, be courageous, and be cunning and wise and clever to be beyond the law. And thus the gods of Protagoras' myth stand outside the law they impose for others. This point is brought up by a later sophist that some of you may know from the Republic. The sophist Thersimachus, a later student, follower perhaps of Protagoras' ideas, proclaims justice is in the interest of the stronger. In other words, those who are able to rule can lay down laws for others. So, in closing, again, this speech is very, very important in the history of ideas because, again, it's in the great speech that we get the first defense of democracy in the history of the world, both in the claim that Zeus gave it to mankind and in, the, in the, uh, what we see that societies expect everyone, not just uh, uh, aristocrats, to act right, but we demand that everybody act ethically. So on the one hand, we look to Protagoras for this important contribution, but we also see, in spite of that, a secret teaching that he's showing some in the ancient Greek world that were, had the ability to rise above this, to assume political rule, were using the rhetorical tricks of the sophists to rise up the ranks and to try to be, again, above the law like one of the gods. Now we're discussing justice of the soul, the highest state of human existence, the whole. This is why punishment, no escape is the goal. Consider the truth every day, every throw. Consider truth when reflecting on all philosophy, righteous existence, and all of human interest. Consider truth when relating what's right and wrong, temperance, what to do and how to stay strong. Consider truth when thinking about inquiry, while studying justice, authority, superiority. Let me hit you with some philosophy, honey. honey. honey.